Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my first question is, is anybody in the audience here who knows how, knows how to set up Keynote with presenter notes? If not, I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, well, I'll have to try it without the notes then. So, did anybody do this? Kevin Jones? Um, maybe he will show you the sketch. I thought it was a good idea to start off with that because uh, I will mention Gene Egger later. He was a very influential part of our study abroad programs, specifically the, the fall travel. And this was an exercise that he gave many times. And it's interesting because the argument is you can, you can study a situation for a moment and then you look around and uh, you try to perceive what is important in the architecture. And then you draw this from memory. And even though the pen might go across the page like this because you perceive this and you perceive that, it, it will become a beautiful drawing because it shows you the, the way you remember the architecture. So uh, you can always repeat that <clears throat> in any situation. Whenever you're bored and you go to another boring lecture, you can, you can do this. So um, I just apologize because I will not have access to my notes here, so I'll have to swing it. So <clears throat> what I'm going to give you is just a, a report of the 2008 to 2019 um, fall travel. And it's a provisional summary. For me, it was a, <clears throat> an interesting uh, retrospective because I had to go through all the materials that I had, uh, sketches, photographs, essays, um, and, and try to make some kind of summary. My, my idea was I wanted to leave something for the school. And uh, it's certainly, I think, interesting if somebody goes back later and see whether there was any kind of indication of how our students observed the architecture. <clears throat> so I have to add one correction here to the, to the poster. Um, this is not me. It's, uh, it's a guy named Willem Bruin, and uh, he was here, actually talked in, in, in Hancock. Okay. Nothing works today. Um, Willem Bruin on the right, on the left, um, drawn by a, a student named Michael Kendrick. So somebody in the office thought that was me. Unfortunately, I'm not that good looking and um, I am maybe a little bit older than this guy. Uh, Willem Bruin, I will mention this very briefly, he has, he's been a great asset to our program because he's, he's taken many students in the, in the Briggins area to very important uh, architecture and he's still a, a great friend that people can access and hopefully the relationship continues. The other person in the photograph <clears throat> is Maria Rohner. She has also been a fantastic uh, asset to, to our fall travel programs and the, and the, the RIVA programs. She's what a Baumschlager and Eberle, a very renowned firm, called the perfect client. Because in one of the buildings that you don't see here, that's, that's on her site, she, uh, she approached the client, uh, she, she approached the architect and said, um, I don't know what I want, I just want architecture. So no program, and it's a building that came about later. It will be a few photographs later. So, <clears throat> 11 years, I think the search for architecture is clearly part of our fall travel programs and also the RIVA programs, certainly, but I will limit myself to the fall travel. So, I'll give you some statistics. 
students, the faculty, itineraries, uh, a traveling library that we always maintained. Um, there are some books written, and I will show you two anecdotal favorites that the students picked and said those were very influential on their, on their travel. And uh, I will talk briefly about sketching on site, and if you have time, uh, I will show you some excerpts from first drafts from the essays. So why travel abroad? I think the, the issue has been discussed many times. I think Frank Weiner gave us a very nice explanation in his recent lecture. Um, I would just want to reiterate Ferrari's argument. Um, so what he, basically what he's trying to say is it doesn't matter where you travel. It takes you out of the normal environment that you have every day, so everything gets kind of dull and you don't have that uh, perception that you would have if you are displaced momentarily. So the travel is kind of important because it takes you out of that normal environment. And then he said the interesting part is when you come back because you will have an opportunity to see what, what was normally ordinary to you and will discover it many times as extraordinary. And I think <clears throat> that was an interesting observation overall. So statistics on fall travel. Um, abroad programs we had since 1969. They were initiated by Olivier Ferrari. And it was known as fall travel since the mid-1980s. So there was a period in between where the Riva location and, and the travel program were essentially the same. And then it separated again about 2005, and uh, we had a Riva program and, and uh, a travel program as separate entities. So the average duration I counted out was 72 days, uh, overnight destinations between 18 and 20 locations. Um, we stayed about an average of three, four days, and the fall travel typically took place between August end of August and mid-November. And then after, after the travel period, so students came back right before Thanksgiving, uh, the semester end, we had a period of independent and online work where mostly the essays were written. So I looked at the numbers. It was kind of interesting to me uh, to find out. So from 2008 to 2019, 417 students went on the, on the program. And if you, if you look at the male-female distribution, it's interesting how sort of the females basically increased, uh, which is commensurate with our uh, enrollment also. In, uh, in 2013, so this is right in the middle, right, you see there is a real drop in, in enrollment. And we were all wondering why that was so the answers for, from, the, from the students, the sign-up was initially the same, but the answers from the students that came back is that the parents had not reserved um, money because in 2008, 2009, there was a big recession, and that's when you, know, you have to start saving, basically, for the program. And that, that did not happen at the time. So we all think that the, most of the effect of the low enrollment in, in 2013 was really due to the aftermath of that recession. And then you can see uh, 44, 43 in 2017, 18 and 19 was very, very strong uh, groups. Um, yet 75 total faculty engagements, uh, 10 female, 65 males, and the faculty usually accompany the group in, in pairs. So there are two faculty, usually between two to four weeks, they stayed with the program, and then we changed them out. So the students went on in travel. So the faculty were usually divided up into three major segments in the program, sometimes four. Um, participating faculty members, uh, it's, it's uh, difficult to read through the entire list, but um, you can see in 2013, when the low enrollment was, we also reduced the number of faculty members in order to keep uh, the price of the, of the travel to a reasonable level. And um, I made a, a couple of lines through here. 
where you can see sort of continuity of faculty members. And after 2017, other people now start to move in, uh, like Kevin Jones and Edward Becker. And I don't know if lately Chris, he was part of the last two fall travel, so. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so when, when faculty go and accompany the students, they also have to interrogate, right? Uh, and so you see the typical mandatory hand gesture by Bill Galloway and, and Chris Pritchard, right? So this is sort of the question of the architecture here. Um, Hans Roth, who is uh, retired in the meantime, and Shelley Martin at the Barcelona Pavilion here. Uh, Kevin Jones, I think the photograph was taken when he was suspended from his drone. And Mario, I saw Mario also here. He's walking away disappointed from uh, the uh, dance lessons. And Jack Davis uh, had to be convinced that this is not Swiss cheese, but it's actually facade by Nieto Sobiano. Um, yeah, this was after a hunt, successful hunt. Uh, Bobby Vance and I and, and Sal at the Norman Foster Dome in, in Berlin. Uh, Hillary at uh, Villa Savoie. Sal always had his camera with him. That was a, his trademark in a way. And he tried to convince students that uh, taking a picture is different than making a photograph. And he was very uh, adamant about the framing of, of the, the image that he would take away. Uh, in, in this photograph, I believe he's convincing the students that Cart Cartier is less important than the architecture. Yeah, this is Chris. It's uh, alcohol-free beer, I believe, right? And you see also our climb of the Olympic roof. So there's a possibility that you can get, get up on the tent roofs. So you have to uh, wear mountain climbing gear. And um, Patrick Doan here, you can see he's strapped in also. And it's, it's really an amazing, an amazing time when you, when you can get up on this very thin plexiglass roof that's all suspended and um, you can sort of feel the tension and, and the sway that uh, this has. Um, Patrick Doan at Ronchamp. And so one student sent me this picture here. <laughs> The list of faculty so that participated is here. And here you see a very happy uh, Jim Jones with an alumnus, uh, Carsten Roth in Hamburg, uh, talking over the architecture um, measures that he took in order to make the project more sustainable. So it was a very interesting dinner conversation. On the other side, I don't have a picture of that. There's actually Rangan Holt. So he was also part of this. Uh, Frank Weiner um, is actually not part of this, but I had this photograph, so I had, thought I had to include it. So over overnight stays, <clears throat> I just draw your attention to the, to the, to the first part. Uh, 12 times in Venice, 12 times in Paris, 12 times in Munich, 11 times in Berlin, 11 times in Florence, 11 times in Rome, Barcelona and Basel followed. It's interesting, you know, why these places emerge. I mean, Venice is a must. Paris, many times, is a must. There's lots of architecture there. Munich was a good arrival point, and there is lots of architecture, and it was one of the most inexpensive places to stay, so to keep the, the program costs down. Barcelona and Basel, they are equally rich uh, with architecture. And then you can see the 
what you can deduct from that is maybe if you look at the places where we stayed once only, it's, um, it's every time you change course, right? You go to another place and, and uh, it just tells you about the variations. So we have some fixed points that we mostly hit and then the other parts are um, places where we, we changed courses. So I, I graphed out uh, the itineraries. Um, here, here you can see in 2008, it was a continuous travel, still went from Munich to Barcelona to Rome. And you, you can see sort of the con continuous map in, in the, um, in, in the, at the map of the graph combined. So uh, the idea was always to also look at the weather. Right? So when we start in August in the fall, uh, Northern Europe is better. And as time went on, so you get into basically late October and November, it was better to stay in the South. Uh, and that pretty much persisted through all, all the programs. Here, this was another continuous program still, um, where we started in Berlin and then went to Rome. Uh, lots of Switzerland here in between. And then from 2010 on, and this was uh, Egger's, Gene Egger's advice, in 2010, we switched, we made one, one change. We added one week or five days, five to six days in between the program, um, because Egger thought that it's, it's good for the, for the students to get apart because in the middle of the program, friction happens. It's just, you stay with people in the same room for, for, for many, many nights. And so we had this five days, six days in between. And so we, we disassembled on one place and reassembled at another place. And I think Gene Egger was perfectly right on the money with that because he said, at the, when they come back together, they will really appreciate organized group travel. And that, that's very, very, very true because when you do it on your own, it's, 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 it's hard. So a 2011 example goes from Munich to Rome via Paris. And you can see also Mario's influence here um, that focuses often on, on Spain. Um, this was a, a kind of a different itinerary because it went to Porto. We had a faculty member here named Christian Gens here who worked for a CISA and uh, could make the CISA work very, very uh, accessible to our students. 2013, sort of similar. So you can see usually the north-south uh, difference. And so 2014 was an interesting uh, Itinerary. You see my arrow here, uh, Dubrovnik. Right? Uh, Margarita is raising her eyes, eyebrows now. And so, why, why suddenly Dubrovnik? It's on the Croatian coast. <clears throat> so the students wanted to go there. So in the in the preparatory meetings, the students said, "Yeah, I really want to go to Dubrovnik." And Dubrovnik is part of the Croatian coast uh, architecture that has many castles and fortifications and lots of interesting things, but not really very much new. Right? So, okay, so fine. I said, we, we, we can arrange that. So the reason for going there was, of course, because the students all knew that Game of Thrones was filmed there and they could visit the same sites. It was uh, interesting. In uh, 2015, we took it away again and um, it was sort of a normal trip that went to Naples and then back to Paris and then ended up in Madrid. And um, the students in 2016 also opted for that. So Margarita was, uh, and her partner, Scott Oliver, they were uh, part of that group. And there were some wonderful sketches actually coming out of that uh, part. 2017, we, we started in Hamburg um, because we had great connections to uh, one of our alumni uh, there who built quite a lot of architecture in, in, in Hamburg. 
and um, we ended up in, in Porto again. So we had previous connections now with uh, Caesar's architecture, and that was uh, very well worked, worked out very, very well. In uh, 2018, um, you see the north arc and uh, the southern route. Uh, it was uh, a, a good, a good travel. We also, for the first time, visited uh, Tomb Tours, uh, uh, Bruder Klaus Chapel. That was a great event. And in 2019, so for the first first time, even though London was very often part of the consideration when the prices came back for the hotels and the other things, it was uh, almost unaffordable in a way. But in 2019, it kind of worked out. And I don't know, everything went down. We got a very special uh, fare because we took the channel train from uh, Paris to, to London and it worked out great. And then people reassembled in the south of Spain and then ended up in, in Lausanne. So that was the last time I was involved in, in, in the program. Every time we, we traveled, we thought it was very important to have some other form of entertainment with you. So we made what's called a traveling library. Uh, you can you can access the full list of the library if you if you grab the the QR code. Um, the the titles are are here, but if if you want. Um, details, you, you, can, you can obtain them. Uh, the uh, criteria for that, so it was suggested by faculty, but the criteria for, for choosing these were actually based on weight. So, so when you travel, right, you, you don't want sort of the, uh, the case study houses book, which is 19 pounds, right? So these were, were all first weighed actually in the library and then uh, uh, suggested. So here's the sort of the, the list of titles. Um, I, and this I only know anecdotally, but the Rasmussen book, Experiencing Architecture, seems to have, be, have been the most uh, favorite. So upon return, so after the travel, right? Um, each student was asked for an essay uh, specifically on one piece of architecture that they love. And so even though students may have chosen the same, uh, it, that did not matter. But it was one particular view, an analysis of some sort, uh, and a contemplation of what they encountered. So the, the idea was really that you had to go back, go through your sketches, try to understand was there really a building, a piece of architecture that you really admired? And, and they took that on in, in the essays. The books also contain a list of places and the architects and some sketches and some photographs. And uh, you guys probably know, in the end, we always made an exhibition in the lobby uh, from, for each program. So <clears throat> these are the covers of the books. Uh, the, the cover designs were always done by students, but uh, first there was an idea, okay, there's some kind of continuity there, but then, you know, you're a student yourself, so now you have to change. And so sometimes the, the cover has some latent continuity, but it was interesting uh, that it, they all came out slightly different. Uh, Here's a, a cover example from, from uh, 2016. So the front and back, so we just chose a map with uh, writings inside the map and then uh, one image in the back. So the student essays, usually there are two to four spreads. In other words, uh, uh, four to eight pages, something like that. And as I already mentioned, it's an investigative and analytical focus on one encountered project. 
So here is a here's an example of the table of contents. Um, they all have very uh, interesting titles, and um, many of the, the the essays were really uh, our first attempt to break into writing in architecture. It's a it's a different kind of communication skill that you have to have, and the the analysis, so to put the analysis in words and combine it with the sketches, uh, we always thought it was a very, very good uh, way of revisiting and uh, bringing a, an idea of conclusion to the travel and and to to exercise your, your analytical abilities. And, and mostly, uh, because they were fourth year students, uh, it was an, an, a good preparation for thesis. In the thesis, usually, you start writing, and uh, the, this kind of exercise was a great preparation for that, I thought. So here's an example. Um, Sidney Garwood's uh, three spreads. So there's six pages. The pages are always facing pages. And you can see a little bit in the enlargement of, of one, one of the pages uh, how the writing was uh, included. Here's another example, uh, Haley Owens, he was just recently here at the career day. Um, first thing she talked to me was about, you know, the, that the essay was really uh, a part of her architectural being now, and uh, it was a great way not only to sketch, but uh, to, to be more explicit about the architectural conditions. Um, Places, buildings, architects. Every book contains that, and and um, the so we basically listed all the places that we visited and the architects uh, that were involved in that. And many, many students told me so after they received the book, they said this is the page where they mostly go back to. Uh, it's because you don't quite remember everything. And these are essentially your references that you build in fourth year. And it was a, a great way of basically having a notation of that. So <clears throat> in, in, the, in the 240 buildings that we visit, so that happens over uh, a, a course of a day, usually between three and four. And three, you, you, of course, you can see more, but the important part was always that you had enough time to draw. If you, if you don't spend time at a building, it doesn't sink in. And that was kind of important. The books are available in the library. Interestingly enough, they are listed on the periodicals, but you, you can find them if you want. Um, and now I just wanted to talk about two anecdotal favorites here. So the first is the crematorium in Berlin. So many students told me that this was a really a great way uh, of accessing architecture. They, they could clearly underst understand that. You'll see the arrow that I put on there. This is the approach from the old gate, and you're going toward the, the new crematorium. You can see the yellow dots in there, and the, the yellow dots are essentially an echo of the existing trees in the cemetery. So you can see all the other dots that are here. So they kind of congregated in, this, in the center. And this is the plan. <clears throat> so I could talk about many aspects of these buildings. It really has great, um, uh, 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 interesting measures that the architect took in order to make it right. But I will uh, uh, restrict myself to only two. So you can see where the, the blue arrow is and, and the red part. That's one of the chapels. And you should pay particular attention to the facade of the chapel. Students are very impressed with that. So if, if you remember, the main, main approach is directly toward the chapel. And so if you put glass there, you have, you have a distraction because people will approach it. And so what the, what the architects did there was a double set of, of Venetian blinds, and they are positioned in such a way that you will not see out on the ground level. 
basically. So we, you will not see the approaching people. But they change, basically, and they open up, so you will see only uh, the canopy of the trees that, that is out there. And it's, it's, it's an impressive measure, so you don't get the distraction. But in terms of contemplation, right, so your, your loved one has just passed away, and the casket is there, and then you, you, what are you going to do? Of course, you're going to think you're about your inheritance, and, and, and you want to have some measure of contemplation. Right? So the trees, the canopy of the trees, I think was a, a great su suggestion. And so here's one of the student sketches about that, right? And you see uh, a detail of that. The other part <clears throat> that I, I will mention where, where students really took to it was the, uh, the columns and that space that the columns make. So the blue part essentially is the roof. And you see that the roof is not resting on the walls, it's only resting on the columns. So I'm gonna rotate this here for a second. In the section, you see how the, f the flat roof essentially is resting on those columns, right? So it's just like a, a tabletop in a way, piece of plywood with a whole bunch of uh, columns or, or feet underneath that that's make that ta tabletop level. So, um, so the one part that's very, very interesting is the structure, right? So if you think about a piece of plywood and you have those columns there, uh, they don't have to necessarily be in a grid. So this is the most important part. However, you see the X is the structure, right? So there is a cross that supports the tabletop, and it makes sense to use an X as a structure. Um, the other part, when you look at the columns again, is because you can move them to some extent, you can actually use them as spatial agents. In other words, you can, you can, you can define spaces, like in this case, you can see each chapel has its own sort of private space that's defined by the columns, and uh, there are two other spaces that are not belonging directly to the chap chapel, but they are also a result of, of the column positions. So it's a great lesson that columns do not have to be in the grid. And, and the other part of the columns that you can detect maybe in this drawing, so I enlarge this, you, you see the, the little yellow mark here? It is the columns have an opening right above them, which is not centric over the column, but it's shifted a little bit. And um, this makes a real magic. So if you look at those drawings here that the students made, so there's a little beam. So you see it in a, in a technical drawing. There's a little beam essentially coming out of the slab and sits over the column. And then you have the opening above the column. So it's, it's really miraculous because light comes at a place where you never expect it because the column is always covered up with material. Right? So in some ways, I would always argue that uh, the, this column is, is like a new Corinthian column, but the light is making the volutes. And it's really an amazing space. So the result you, you, you can see here And it's really imp an imp just an impressive space. And our students just loved it. And fortunately, we have we had always had enough time to uh, to draw. Although there are some stories attached to that. At uh, one time, the, the um, director of the crematorium, she, she wanted to lock the students out because she said, very disturbing whatever happens there. And uh, I said, well, as far as I know, this is a public place. And if she wants to uh, throw us out, if you haven't done anything, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> uh, I had to put, uh, there, there, there were some consequences to that later. <laughs> um, but she let us stay, ultimately. She, was, she walked away. She was very disappointed that she couldn't uh, kick me out. Um, not only the students like this building, so 
Kevin, you've seen the John Wick four, chapter four, right? See, it's you can you can see that the background is in fact the crematorium, right? And if you notice, is, I was just informed about this this morning that the Hunger Games also were filmed in there. The I think it's fourth one. The other building that I think students very much loved uh, is uh, Notre Dame uh, du Haut. It's Ranchon, Le Corbusier's uh, chapel. So he, here's a, a postcard of the original chapel, and it's a it's a pilgrimage place. So students um, um, discovered that pilgrimage is actually a great congregation, and um, Le Corbusier found this place also. You know, so here you see the original chapel. So there was a fire in uh, 1913. So these kind of towers burned down. And then in 1944, it was bombed. And this is basically how Le Corbusier found it um, a decade later, approximately. These are his drawings. So this is the, the side sketch of Le Corbusier. And he, Look, look at the, the 1944 version, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very precise uh, allo allocation of, of the building. I picked this because it's, it's important that you understand that the sketch does not have to be pretty. This is maybe not a pretty sketch, but it's very precise and, and makes a great notation. And um, the, the other part, I think that's kind of important uh, to understand is that that building is a strange building. When I was a student, I thought it was really weird that this was supposed to be architecture until I actually got there. And I think today's students, it's still the same. You you see the the, the shell development. Right? It's, it's actually a very highly constructed uh, membrane of, of, of concrete with uh, periodic uh, Verndale beams, and and uh, the the um, um, Robin Evans, famous author, uh, architecture books. He said, very important to understand that this is actually a ruled surface. I mean, ruled surfaces have straight lines, and the curvature was generated with uh, all stra straight lines. So the the beams, you you can see it in the in the plan. Where they are located over the, over the chapel, and um, so one of the first drawings of uh, Corbusier and a conception of the interior. One of our students said, "Oh, I see what he's doing. He's oops, he's he's making a regular ch church with the Latin cross." Um, the the other part that was always important about Ranchon as I said before, is the discovery that is actually a pilgrimage uh, place. So in the pilgrimage place, you have essentially the chapel, which is sort of active throughout the year, but it's a very small part. But the, uh, the pilgrimage is, I think, September 7th at, at Ranchon. The, uh, the congregation is actually outside. So the argument is that the church at Ranchon is outside. The chapel makes the altar, and the inside of the chapel here in, in blue is just for the rest of the year. So here is one of the events, uh, 1962. Of course, the south wall uh, is, is kind of a, an important um, device that students always try to remember. And I found it quite interesting that when you look at the construction of, of the south wall, uh, it is filled with the rubble of the original church. So there's the memory of the church not, is not visible, but it's preserved in that wall. And uh, the, the measure that Le Corbusier took is he takes the southern light actually and projects it through those very specific openings uh, into the inside of the chapel, which is a great um, device actually to activate that space in a very, very special manner. So 
most of you will recognize this. The, the other part uh, that students also recognize at, at Ron Schoenwitz is it's very interesting. You guys know Le Corbusier's five points, perhaps. He doesn't execute all the five points of what I would call his orthodox modern architecture ideas. But there's definitely the piloti, so the vertical that supports the roof, and he lifts, he lifts the roof about four inches. So you can see the gap between the roof and the wall, and, and it's sort of the, the quintessential moment of modern architecture where you see the piloti or column columns, if you want, uh, separate the walls from the load. In other words, then the wall can do whatever it wants in a way. And you, you can see the free movement of, of the walls on the inside, which is essentially the, imp the implementation of what he called the free plan and the free facade. Uh, other moments at Ranchon is the tower, right? You look up, how the light is scooped in. It's just a fantastic part. Um, it was a notation of uh, a Chinese student, uh, I, which happened actually at, at Ranchon, you know, trying to recite the five points. Uh, point number three, <clears throat> so if it's translated correctly, right, it says four free facade. So the, students basically, <laughs> the student basically said, oh, it's the facade that doesn't cost anything. Same thing with the free plan. So we, we, we drew, or I sent the students in, and, and I asked them to draw the plan three times. So they went in, they saw it, they went back out, we looked at the sketches, you go back in again, and you draw it again. And in the evening, so we were somewhere, I gave them a napkin before dinner, and they drew it from memory. And it was, it's kind of interesting. Uh, in, in the lobby right now, if you look at sort of the center part, so there's, these are all Ranchon sketches. And to me, it's kind of interesting how students perceive the interior because it's, it's a, obviously an unusual plan until you actually get to it and, and you try to understand how it's organized. So here, I think, is a uh, wonderful drawing um, that tries to establish the relationship between the, the south wall and the plan. Um, let's see if that works here. Ranchon also, of course, has been discovered by the film industry. And here, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, maybe. Uh, it's and used by um, other people as well, because it's just a wonderful space. For me, it was a great pleasure, actually, to also go through all of those uh, photographs. And there are some, so many memorable moments. You know, we could go on forever. But um, I probably get some smile in the back here. I see Hunter already giggling. Uh, uh, we had this bus driver, uh, fr his name was Franco. So we always had the same bus driver every year until he retired. Um, and it was interesting to see how Franco's expertise in architecture was building and building and building. And he kind of knew everything, including all the tricks where you could get in and was a really a amazing part uh, or he was essentially just like a student and uh, took us to many places. Uh, the, the, we go through weather, right? But um, I never heard really a complaint about when it was raining or cold. Uh, or beautiful. This is in front of uh, the Neues Museum in Nuremberg. Um, at, at Vitra, of course, we have to test out all of the furniture. Um, 
This is at a museum in, in, in Munich. And then food. Um, at a meal in Paris, right? So surprisingly, it was not your um, meatloaf or other things that you might eat at home, but it was a whole fish. And uh, it was fantastic to see, you know, how do you actually separate the meat from the bones and the, the giggling that, that happened uh, during uh, this meal in Paris. It was just fabulous. I just re remember it very vividly. It was a competition, in essence, to, to eat that fish, right? So at other times, right, you know, we have entries into specific venues, and here they display their arm. Um, Chris Pritchett was a good sport. It's uh, at the, um, the city hall in a, of a town called Umberg. It was between Prague and and Nuremberg, and so we, we we had stopped there with the bus for lunch, and then there was nobody on the on the plaza, so you know, which kind of spread out, made, made the photograph. Um, the photograph appeared later in a newspaper. <laughs> Look. Oh, and of course, sketchbook reviews. You can see here Chris Pritchard also. So the, the drawing is, is, a, is a very important part of fall travel. And you, you can see also the students share essentially techniques and approaches and what they observe. And this is really a great part of the learning there. Um, yeah, the right, the photograph here shows Chris all geared up in mountain climbing gear, uh, advising the students not to fall down. In the evenings, many times, you know, you start a sketch and then people just got, found a place in the evening actually to, to complete the sketch, which is a perfectly legitimate activity, right? That you continue and you follow through with the sketch. Another great moment in Paris. So you're waiting for those people to get out of the way. Um, here, a moment at Vitra with the Eames elephant. So you see the original elephant head with the uh, Ray Eames made out of plywood. Um, a very special moment was the visit of the new mosque in, in Cologne. Um, you know, visiting a mosque is not so straightforward. Females have to cover their head. If you, if you go to a synagogue, it's the opposite. <laughs> so we did that both, but uh, the, uh, we had two separate tours also. The female had to tour separately from the males. That was great. And of course, this, you know, I can just reiterate that the sketching has been such an important part of that. And it is um, always an argument that the sketching is a form of memory. And uh, you will never forget a, a sketch that you made. The other part that I will need to mention is the alumni. So here you see Doreen Ebert and the project architect for uh, uh, Neues Museum in, in Nuremberg by David Chipperfield. And she, she gave us a great tour. So I was arguing with her in Berlin, in Hamburg. Uh, Becky Chestnut, she lectured here several times, Berlin office. And uh, Christian Mauch, who is in Basel, who always took the group on, is reviewing sketchbooks here. Sometimes we're very lucky here. Uh, we meet up at the, the Bellinzona um, swimming pools with uh, uh, Aurelio Galfetti passed away, I think a year ago, maybe. One great story, Dutch embassy in Berlin, right? Rem Kolhaas' elevator, capacity 11, actual occupation 19, elevator stopped, malfunction between the floors, fire department had to come. So it took about an hour and a half, right? So 
we were stuck in between. So students like this with the sketchbook, I right, started the sketch. Then the embassy personnel, I did not know that before. I mean, you can open the doors and you, theoretically you could get out, but that's not allowed because the elevator could drop and shear off your body, right? So we were in there, we were in there. So the embassy personnel then started to come. So they, they gave us chocolate and beer. <laughs> and it made the sort of stay in the elevator really memorable. So sketching on site. Um, Here's uh, Willem Bruin again in, in, the, in the building that I mentioned before. Um, it's, it's a very important endeavor. The, the notation that you make, you will never forget. The reviews uh, of the sketchbooks are equally important because that's when you learn how to share and to, uh, uh, understand uh, different techniques. The, um, the sketches in the lobby uh, they will not, they're not uh, picturesque. I left the picturesque ones out. The picturesque is a sort of a technique where you imitate a photograph, but I did not um, pick that. Uh, to imitate a photograph is, is a skill, and it's an admirable skill. However, in my opinion, the really valuable sketch is the analytic sketch, so the multiple uh, combinations that you have together. So here are some picturesque examples. And Le Corbusier's uh, sketchbook is really uh, a great lesson for me. Also, you know, those sketches are not pretty, but they're extremely informative. Uh, Marco Foscari had another kind of technique, sketching as a theory, right? So he made these kind of wonderful uh, drawings that you cannot uh, reproduce in a photograph. And uh, here's an example of uh, uh, Choisy. Who, who, who travels, makes, makes the sketches, and then turns them later on into a theory uh, of architecture. So in the, in the form of memory, right, you have the argument that you just don't forget that. You don't forget that. And so here's an, here's an interesting um, example. So two architects are drawing the same thing, and you see how different that is. So. Uh, Arne Jakobsen and Louis Kahn. Right? Uh, just a wonderful way how you as a person, you can see the things different. Different. The photograph will not make that dis different differentiation. Uh, Egger, you perhaps know uh, the, uh, the Paradox of Place, his, his book. Right? He was very influential. And I think the, the important part that I wanted to make about Egger is his approach <clears throat> is like um, a cubist approach where Pablo Picasso and uh, George Brock, for instance, are the, the spearheading the effort. The argument is that if you draw in multiple perspectives, you get a more true view of the object. And then Egger, of course, he does that with his X-ray vision, so he overlays multiple conditions uh, at the same time, so if you, have, if you don't know the book, you can check it out at the library. Um, it can also be, I think, purchased in the regular bookstores. So here are some examples of those uh, Egger's advice and X-ray drawings. The other Egger typology, I think, is the plan and section combination. So even though nothing is really straight in there, I think it's a beautiful drawing that accounts very well for that. The other part, you know, details. And I think this very beautiful sketch done in about five minutes. It's just amazing, you know, the, the picking apart of the Maison Carré here. So, Yeah, Heisenberg. It's a page from a sketchbook. Uh, Michael Kendrick, he has one of the funniest um, parts in there, and one of them made it into the poster, but it's, it's really great. So here we, we see that Ronchamp, the plan of Ronchamp. 
and what is it? It's a big part of being an architect to make sure uh, you understand your ideas and you know they will work. That was the end of the sketchbook. So I'll, I, will, I will end here and um, you know, maybe enjoy those sentences. So in the essays, when the essays came back the first time, I tremendously enjoyed that, even though it took me practically all winter break to go, th to go through them. But some of the sentences or expressions, they were really, really, really funny. Um, so I can read this here for, for a moment. With these shapes, Botta creates a more complicated symmetry than just the reflective symmetry which is also in the project, but he creates also a rotational symmetry. Uh, Scarpa made hundreds of drawings for all of his projects, some of them are still undiscovered. The <laughs> um, structure can be compared to the boat in that above the water it is vulnerable and you can, you can see what's going on. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yes. I can I can make that available. Yeah. How has it influenced me? Next question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's definitely some influence. I haven't really reflected on that so much. But um, when, I, when I took students to certain projects, right, I, my favorite question always was, um, can you tell me what the idea is for the building? So it forced me also to be much more precise in my language overall in the descriptions of things that I think were discernible, tangible, that I could sort of extract out. And so in all of my other talks that I gave in other classes in, in the studio, uh, I think that helped me actually be more precise in the, in the communication of where I think the architecture is. So oh, I barely could understand you, but I, I think the, the program itself undoubtedly colored our school. There's no question about that. I think the fact that also faculty traveled and came back with a rich amount of material, it's, it's, it definitely steered our program. And I think it made also a difference between uh, Virginia Tech's architecture program and the many other architecture programs that were out there. Other programs travel as well, but I think there is a, was a different kind of intensity always with the fall travel program that uh, really made us what we are. And yeah, I definitely think so. Any, any other questions? Um, a couple of notes about the, the exhibition. So I titled it 1,000 Sketches, but I lied. Uh, there are only 768. And 
well, the decision was maybe not to go that low because they would hang too low and, and so on. Um, one consideration was, you know, if hammering each sketch would take forever. So fishing lines came about, sort of just like dirty laundry or laundry laundry hanging, hanging there. And uh, I had made an attempt to actually classify more so, but I gave that up because the, the sketches are so different in a way, and yet they have great similarities. So what I said before is I did not put any picturesque sketches out there. So my selection was from about 12,500 sketches. And um, I thought, I'm just going to put out the most informative ones. So they're not pretty. Many of them are not pretty, but I think they are good. And that was the idea, I, to put it out uh, once. I, I had a conversation with uh, special collections here at the library, so it looks like they're going to archive them, so they will be accessible. And I think that, that's hopefully it's a good, it's a good thing. Um, tomorrow, yeah. For the, the, the students that you know, I saw, I, they were, which some, some of which were my own thesis students, and others were thesis students of others, where I, I stayed in contact. The, um, there, is, there was an obvious influence of a building of references from which you could draw. And I think that tremendously influenced the thesis work also, that you could say, you know, I can point to this crematorium thing, and I tr understand what can be done with shrinking the tabletop a little bit to let that gap of light exist and material questions, sometimes details. Uh, and, and I think it was just enormous richness that just always came out of the program. And I think the one semester part before the fifth year was about right. right? So that would be my accounting of that. I don't know if the that's what it was discussed and um, we had sometimes in other programs also students earlier but I think there's a maturity level at fourth year already uh, where the capacity to take in was just better and I think this was the reason why it kind of remained in fourth year. It's, but it, it's, it's a question that certainly could be entertained, you know, maybe students, students who travel every semester. You guys should. Maybe it doesn't have to be that long, but I think it's important. Other questions? David Haney? You like your Berlin excursion? Um, so one announcement. Oh, I have to acknowledge Mario here. So he was a, an enormous helper in the whole program. Uh, he also had some expertise that I did not have, and I came with watercolor. So the the idea of the translucency of the watercolors in, this, in, in many of the sketches are certainly due to Mario's influence. I think it was good, and you know, you saw earlier how many times he was involved. Um, so one note: tomorrow at three afternoon, uh, please take the sketch that you want. Take it. Yeah, I would love for the lobby to be empty. Um, 
on, on <clears throat> so the, the sketches are folded over. On the back side is the name of the author. Right. So if you feel up to it, contact the author. You'll find him on LinkedIn or someplace and say, I have your sketch. I think they will be very happy. Um, I will also add more sketches tomorrow so that the thousand are really complete. And um, hopefully, you know, there's an opportunity to see something in the sketch, be it a technique or an idea or something that you can extract from that that would help you as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>